Welcome to the War Academy channel. More than 70 years have passed, since this sound was heard over the skies of Germany, and although none of us have suffered the experience of being bombed, it still causes fear and fear. Can you imagine what it would be like to listen to it several times a day, for more than one or two years, while you suffer the consequences of the bombings? Can we put ourselves in the shoes of someone who sees how everything around him is falling apart, and all the people he meets do nothing but die? Next, in this program, we are going to see what the daily life of the German civilian population was like, in one of the cities that was repeatedly bombed. We will see how the warnings worked, what guarantees the shelters offered, what were the first actions they did after hearing the alarm, how they spent time inside them and much more. As we have seen in other programs, the first massive bombardments of German cities began in mid-1942, the year after which they only intensified until reaching their highest point in 1944. It is estimated that there were approximately 1,600,000 tons of bombs were dropped on Germany during the entire conflict. And the percentages that we have calculated with respect to each year are the following. In 1942, 4% of the total were launched. In 1943 they were 13%. In 1944 this figure reached 56%. And finally in 1945 the remaining 26% was launched. The objective of these bombings has been something much discussed and questioned, both in the years in which these actions were being carried out, and in subsequent years. Although from the Allied side itself, there were opinions that were against these indiscriminate massive bombings on the German civilian population, Arthur Harris, commander-in-chief of the Bomber Command, insisted in always fight to make the following prevail. The objective of our bombings is the destruction of German cities, the death of German workers, and the dismantling of civilized social life throughout Germany. This was the vision he always imposed, and each time he was asked to change it, Harris, nicknamed the Butcher Harris, was against it and only gave in to modify it for a short time. One of them was when he was assigned the mission of the bombardment of northwestern France, before the imminent Allied invasion. Arthur Harris, was very hurt, when he had to allocate part of his force to these missions, instead of bombing Germany. It should be noted that only during the Allied bombardments in the Normandy region, more French civilians died as collateral damage than British during the German raids. This, of course, was the subject of discussion between the French authorities and the Anglo-American commanders during this campaign, wondering if it had really been necessary to drop so many bombs on French soil to defeat the Germans. Finally, the other time when these targets were requested to be changed was also during the spring of 1944, when the bombing of German synthetic fuel plants began. To date, these plants had been operating quite normally, and not even the German leaders themselves, such as Albert Speer, explained how they had not previously focused their interest on them. To give us an idea, of the reduction in fuel production that this generated, in April 1944, the Luftwaffe received a monthly supply of 180,000 tons of fuel, while in August of that same year, it fell to only 10,000 tons. With these resources, they had to face the Allied air raids, which were increasingly intense. Having already got an idea of how the situation was, let's now see how this event was lived in the cities that received these attacks. It all began, when the large bomber formations were detected, either by the German radar stations, or directly by the anti-aircraft observers. When they saw that the Allied bombers flew over their positions, and entered the interior of their country. Once the route of these planes was identified, the populations that were in their possible path began to be notified. The first alarm in the cities sounded when these bombers were about 200 kilometers from it. This gave a margin of about 40 minutes, before the enemy aircraft reached them. The first actions they used to carry out was to fill the bathtub with water, in case after the bombings this supply was cut off. They also had to turn off the lights and gas, 
as well as keep the radio on to be informed of any news regarding the attack they were going to receive. They also made sure their valuables were safely stored, that their flashlights had charged batteries, that they grabbed their gas masks, and prepared some food and drink. While they carried out all these tasks, in which they also put on appropriate clothing according to the outside temperature, the population was waiting for the second alarm. Which confirmed that the enemy bombers were definitely heading to their area, and also indicated that they were already much closer. After the second warning, it was time to go to the shelters that each had established, and sit in them while they waited for everything to pass. These were moments of great tension, which were shared with their relatives and neighbors, in which no one knew what they would meet when they could surface. Would the bombers finally pass by? Would my house be standing when it was all over? Would the shelter withstand the impact of a bomb if it fell nearby? How many more bombardments will we have to endure? These were the most frequent questions that people asked themselves, that practically every day, they were forced into this situation. Although many factories were not damaged by the bombings, the presence of workers in it was affected, because their stay in these shelters often prevented them from going to work. Even when the bombs reached the factory, if they did not do it very directly, the Germans were able to resume production in just a few days. Proof of this is that industrial manufacturing levels only increased in 1944, despite the fact that it was also the year in which more bombs were dropped on Germany. With regard to the people who waited in the shelters at the end of the bombing, it must be said that their guarantees of survival were not even less than 100%. Many of them died due to suffocation, which was caused by the large number of people that were grouped in them and due to the lack of oxygen. As we saw in another program, the oxygen levels had to be monitored with candles that were placed at different heights. In summary we will say that when the candle that was placed more than one meter high went out, everyone had to leave the shelter immediately, even with the risk of dying from the explosions. There was also the danger of being trapped in them after the building above them collapsed. Another danger was to die because the enormous heat that was caused on the surface, due to the fires, killed those who were in the shelters. Other times, the rupture of a pipe or boiler could flood these basements and drown those who were inside. In Berlin itself, a scene of this type was experienced, when the water of the river Spree flooded a subway tunnel in which there were many Berlin refugees, during the battle for the city. Based on these great damage, the German authorities advised the civilians of the main cities to send a trunk with clothes and other valuable objects to an acquaintance or family member who lived in a more rural area. With this it was intended that in the case of their house being destroyed, they could then go to the home of this other person and thus keep some of their possessions. Once the bombardments ended, and little by little they were leaving the shelters, all the people went to check if the houses were still standing. The wife of a soldier who served under model, sent the following letter to her husband. The trams are not working, and it seems that a great plow has devastated the entire city. We do not have water or electricity, and gas suffers continuous cuts. Food is also scarce and more and more people are sick. Candlelight can be something very endearing at Christmas or at a romantic dinner. But living with it every day makes you feel a great loneliness and sadness. My nerves are totally unhinged, and I can hardly sleep. To this testimony, we must add other thoughts, such as knowing if their husbands and children who were at the front were still alive, and if they would see them again when it was all over. Finally, another of the very characteristic things of those times was that the desperation suffered by these people led them to divulge all kinds of fantasies and hoaxes which on the other hand they needed to hold on to better cope with that situation. One of the most famous was the one that spread through the city of Dresden, which was one of the few large German cities that at the beginning of 1945 had not yet been bombed. This theory said that the city was not going to suffer any air attack since it had been established by the Allies as their capital during the occupation and therefore they wanted to conquer it intact. In the same way that it happens, with the atomic bombs that the Americans dropped on Japan, mainly as a warning to the Soviets. 
there is an official report that was given to the bomber squades that were going to bomb the city, in which it was said that one of the objectives of this attack was to demonstrate to the Soviets what the bomber command was capable of doing. This was because the city was to be under Soviet control in a few weeks. Well, so far this program, in which we have explained in the most complete way possible, how this situation was. One of the books that has helped us the most to carry out this program has been Armageddon by Max Hastings, whose link I'll leave you in the description, along with other similar programs, in which we saw in general terms what life was like in Berlin during the first months of 1945. This is it. Subscribe and support this channel if you like this program and see you in the next one, see you soon.